Hi, my name is Ross Muldoon and I work for AMS and you are very welcome to my presentation on our excavations at Shank Hill in Roscommon. Firstly, I'd like to thank Rathcrohan Kruchany Centre for hosting this talk online in these strange times. It is a pity that their planned conference had to be called off this year, but we look forward to helping out with some events later in the year, either during Heritage Week or later again when hopefully things are returning to some type of normality. I would also like to acknowledge Roscommon County Council, the Department of Transport and Transport Initiative Ireland who are, over are overseeing the project and funded the excavations. At Shank Hill we uncovered a fascinating range of archaeology, stretching from prehistory through the medieval and up until recent times. But before we look at Shank Hill itself, I'll give you some project background and the layout and structure of this talk. The talk will be in five parts. Firstly, I will give you some of the project background. Then we will look at Shank Hill and why it is important, and then how the remains were discovered. The next and main section of the talk will look at what we found on the excavation. Although the results are only preliminary and we are awaiting dates, I think you will agree that they are quite exciting. Finally, we will consider what next for Shankill. What will the post X entail and what might we still be able to find out? The excavations at Shankill were undertaken in advance of the N5 Balladrine um, to Scramog Road project. The N5 road ultimately connects Dublin in the east of Ireland with Westport in the west. This new section, as depicted in red on this map, starts just east of Strokestown in County Roscommon and goes north of Strokestown, skirts south of Elfin, north of Bellingar, and rejoins the main road just east of Balladrine. The green line on this map is the old N5, and as you can see, the road takes a major diversion to the north. This is to avoid the archaeological complex of Rathcrohan, one of Ireland's preeminent archaeological landscapes. Rathcrohan is known in myth as the royal site of Connacht, the seat of legendary Queen Maeve and the starting point of Ireland's most famous epic, the town Cúinne. The archaeological remains there share characteristics with Tara in Meath, Dunalainne in Kildare, Awan Macha in Armagh and Ishnach in Westmead, along with which it is listed for potential world heritage status. So the new N5 route avoids this important complex. However, it still consists of 33 kilometres or over 33 kilometres of new road going through fine pasture lands of North Common. And whenever you put a project of this magnitude, you will inevitably encounter archaeological remains. So before the project starts, archaeologists carry out a range of background research, including geophysics, LIDAR, paleoenvironmental coring, aerial survey, underwater survey and of course archaeological testing. Through these various techniques we and our various colleagues have identified over a hundred sites, only a handful of which were known about before the start of the project. A project like this really is like a massive test trench through a landscape and represents an extraordinary opportunity to investigate almost all periods of the people past in North Roscommon. And even though it avoids the important complex of Rathcrohan, it is investigating contemporary sites within its wider landscape, earlier ones that give us insight into why this became such an important landscape, and later sites which lived in the shadow of, Rath of um, Rathcrohan. So where is Shankill and how were the remains there discovered? Well, Shankill is located just east of the town of Elfin. It is not actually on the mainline route of the new N5, but rather on an ancillary route that is being upgraded. Also, the remains were not really discovered, as anyone from the area will tell you, they were already known about. The first clue is in the name of the townland. Shankill is, of course, the Irish for Old Church, and the graveyard at Shankill does house the now invisible remains of a medieval church. It is important to note that the graveyard and church, which are protected monuments, are not being disturbed by this development, and it is previously unknown remains that were excavated. The importance or significance of the remains at Shankill is elevated by historical references, particularly by the belief 
and records that attribute its ecclesiastical foundation to St. Patrick. According to various references, it was the site of a pre-existing mound of a local tribe at which Patrick founded a church in 434 AD for the Archpresbyter Rodan, who is supposed to have come with him from Britain. St. Patrick's biographers had many reasons for connecting him with the conversion of all of Ireland to Christianity and the establishment of nearly every medieval foundation around the country. Specifically, they were trying to establish and reinforce the primacy of Armagh in later years. Nonetheless, whether we accept that St. Patrick actually ex established the foundation at Shankill, the reference to it and Elphin by his biographers established the importance of those sites and perhaps some of the people who are associated with them. Today, the remains at Shankill are visible as a graveyard at the crossroads between the R369 and N61, just east of Elphin and some distance north of Tulsk. The remains of a medieval church are believed to be in the northeast corner, and there are several medieval grave markings among the more modern burials. A fragment of a decorated quernstone was found in the graveyard during works by a Foss scheme some years ago. As mentioned before, the development does not impact on the graveyard. The majority is restricted to the far side of the road. In this image, you can see the results of a geophysical survey that was carried out by Earth Sound in 2015. The red line marks the edge of the impact of the new road, and in the course of these projects, we are, of course, restricted to excavating within the area of impact. We can, however, using non-destructive techniques, survey outside that area with the agreement of landowners. Some of what you can see in this image is modern quarry activity, but other lines, including the possible enclosure marked with the number two, do represent archaeological remains. Armed with the results of the geophysical survey, testing by Archer Heritage in 2015 confirmed the presence of archaeological features comprising hearths, linear features and dispersed pits. However, a significant quantity of the potential features identified in the geophysical survey appeared to be natural in origin, and no enclosure consistent with the edge of an ecclesiastical site was found, um, like one might expect to be across the road from the church at Shankill. Two samples were taken during this testing, this phase of testing, and they returned radiocarbon dates, one from a linear feature returned an early Neolithic date, and one from a pit or hearth, an early medieval date. So now we move on to the actual excavation and the results. Here you can see the outline of the areas excavated, areas one, two, three, and four. These targeted the remains confirmed during the testing and were extended several times during the excavation. In addition, as much of the area close to the crossroads and the site of Shankill graveyard as was accessible without removing the road, was opened. This is an overview of one of the areas, Area 2, mid-excavation. Here you can see a complex of overlapping ditches, some relatively modern, but mostly medieval, and some potentially prehistoric. The graveyard is just northwest of this, to the top left of the image. The earliest finds on site include half a Neolithic stone axe, around five and a half thousand years old. It is also made from a very interesting type of stone, Langdale Tuff. Tuff is a kind of compressed volcanic ash, and the Langdale Tuff used to make these axes comes from a very narrow range of outcrops in northwest of England. While there are thousands of Neolithic axes from Ireland, there are only around 120 of these. Researchers in England have established that they come from the tops of two particular mountains, Scaffold Pike and Harrison Stickle. In other words, our axe is made from compressed volcanic dust harvested from some of the highest peaks in England. If this sounds like stuff of legend, then bear in mind that Neolithic people could probably have got similar tuff from easier to reach locations. Perhaps its source mattered, and the people who acquired the axes really did want what was hardest to get. There were several other Neolithic finds on site, including Knapp Chert, Flint, and crystal, uh, quartz crystal lithics. The black chert scraper on the left of this image is a multi-tool with a hollow scraper on one side, a 
convex scraper on the other, and a broken borer extending from its top. A kind of Neolithic Swiss Army knife, if you like. While we now have ample evidence of Neolithic activity at Shank Hill, not many of the features can yet be securely ascribed to that period. However, once the post-excavation phase is underway and we get radiocarbon dates, we will likely be able to do this. There were also some prehistoric burials at Shank Hill. In Area 3, next to R369 into El Fin, a cremation deposit was found at the base of a pit. Most of the cremated bone was found in a small pit at the base of a larger pit, but some was also scattered through the fill of the larger pit, a sequence that we are still trying to understand. A second possible cremation was found in one of the other of the four areas. These burials at Shank Hill may be particularly significant. If you remember, near the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that St. Patrick's biographers said he founded the church next to the mounds of a local tribe. Prehistoric burials like these would support the likelihood that there were mounds and the like at Shank Hill. If the identification of Shank Hill as St. Kildonal of St. Patrick's um, biographers is correct, then we should expect to find the type of material typical of an early medieval monastic centre or at least the type of archaeology you would find on the periphery of one at Shank Hill. And I would argue that is exactly what we found. There were several cereal drying kilns of various ages, um, running probably from the very early medieval up into the high medieval period. Here I show you um, just three examples. Um, you can see in the bottom left a very large, probably high medieval stone lined one. It's almost six meters in length. Above that there, you can see a smaller, probably earlier medieval example, and maybe another high medieval one to the right hand side. There were several more of these at Shank Hill. And while they were of different ages, they were all operated in the same basic way. Grain, after being harvested, needed to be dried for storage. It still is today. A large fire was lit at one end of the kiln, and then hot air was driven up a flue to where the grain sat on some form of rack. We also found what are probably the remains of grain storage platforms or raised granaries at Shank Hill. Here you can see a nice reconstruction of the type of structure I am talking about. They were raised up off the ground to protect the grain from the damp. What all this adds up to, the cereal drying kilns and the raised granaries, is to conjure an image of a very active agrarian landscape, at the centre of which both religiously and economically were ecclesiastical foundations. This is exactly the type of evidence we would expect to find adjacent an early medieval and later medieval ecclesiastical centre. There were also other signs of industry at Shank Hill too. This is a particularly large piece of slag or metalworking waste, and only one piece of wheelbarrows full that were found at Shank Hill. The metalworking waste was found across the site, but was most plentiful near this fascinating structure, what we believe to be a medieval forge. Here on the left-hand side, in the left-hand side photo, you can see a roughly rectangular structure, like um, so, out the back of which there was some large elongated pits. These are cut into the surface of an earlier medieval ditch. Um, in the image on the right hand side you can see the structure mid-excavation, um, something like so. Um, and in the centre of it you can see a small keyhole shaped furnace and two longer furnaces, or pits at least. Um, in the end of this um, large pit there was a small post hole that we believe to be an anvil base um, and it seems that both copper working and iron working might have been taking place in this structure. The waste was mostly thrown out into these pits at the back. In one of those pits we even found the whetstone that presumably belonged to the smith who worked at this location. I mentioned that we believed both iron and copper working may have taken place in the forge. This supposition is supported by fragments of crucibles and possible mould fragments. A crucible is a container in which metal or other substances can be melted or exposed to high temperatures. 
Most popularly, it was utilized to smelt copper alloys, especially leaded bronze, which was referred to as Latin in medieval texts. Small examples like this one from Shankill may have even been used um, to smelt more precious metals, such as silver or gold. Good parallels for this exist from Lagor, a very high status early medieval crown oak in County Meath. This combination of iron, copper, and perhaps even finer metalworking at Shankill might suggest exciting ecclesiastical objects such as bells were being made at Shankill. Roscommon has, of course, a very fine heritage in this regard. One only has to think of the Cross of Cong, probably produced in Roscommon itself, or that the patron saint of Elphin, only hundreds of metres from Shankill, was St. Asicus, St. Patrick's own coppersmith. Other finds at Shankill included shale and lignite bracelets, one of the most ubiquitous of find types from Irish medieval sites. Most of these fragments are from broken bracelets, but at least one is a fragment of an unfinished bracelet, an evidence of production at Shankill. Evidence of production is relatively rare and will allow another blue dot to be added to this recent distribution map, the first dot in Roscommon. There were also plenty of animal bones found at Shankill. Included among these were several medieval dog skeletons, at least one of which was placed as a foundation deposit in the slot of a structure. Analysis of these may allow us to look at the emergence of different dog sizes and perhaps even breeds. Other finds included later medieval objects, such as this 14th or 15th century copper alloy thimble. These later medieval or post medieval beads. And this fragment of 16th, 17th German stoneware, likely similar from a vessel similar to this Spartman or Bellarmine jug currently on display in Galway Museum. There were also two medieval burials. At Shankill. Both were of females, one elderly and the other relatively young. This individual, the older female, was buried supine, lying on her back. At some point shortly after her burial, it was disturbed and someone lifted up and put back her femur upside down. This was done when there must have been some connective tissue remaining, because the patella, or kneecap, was in the correct position relative to the upside down femur. Some of the remains found at Shankill were much more recent. One such object was a Sacred Heart medal, perhaps lost by someone working in the field or visiting the nearby graveyard. On the front of it you can see Jesus, indicating his Sacred Heart. It was found by one of our Spanish colleagues, who by a seemingly strange coincidence is named Jesus or Jesus during his first day digging in Ireland. There were a lot more features at Shankill, and I've only had time here to look at a few. We are still disentangling all the stratigraphic relationships and awaiting dates, but we can now say some things with certainty. At Shankill, we found evidence, including agricultural and industrial activity, that is consistent with what one would expect to find on the periphery of an early monastic and later ecclesiastical site. We also found early prehistoric remains that included prehistoric burials, such as one would expect to find near mounds marking the territory of a tribe, such as mentioned by St. Patrick's biographers. Perhaps most excitingly, we may have found a site where ecclesiastical objects were produced, helped helping connect the traditions of the very early St. Asicus copper worker with the later production of objects like the Cross of Kong in Roscommon. In some ways, the end of the excavation is only the beginning of the work. We, have now, we are now in the post-excavation phase. We took hundreds of soil, metalworking waste and animal bone samples at Shankill and found hundreds of objects. All of these have to be cleaned, analysed and looked at by specialists. Eventually, we hope to publish one or more journal articles specifically on Shankill and the results of the excavation. Um, this will also eventually form a major part of the scheme monograph. There are, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, over 100 sites being excavated as part of the N5 
Bala had dreamed to Scrimog Road Project, and likely many further exciting finds remain to come to light. As a wrap up, I'd just like to thank all the crew who worked at Shank Hill. It was a particularly enjoyable excavation with a particularly great crew who will forever be known as the Shank Killers. Thank you. Bye.